Hi and welcome back to the channel. This time around I'm doing things a little bit differently. I'm going to go over a bunch of films that I've seen that I haven't talked about on the channel before. So the movies over the last couple of months that I've watched, they didn't really fit into the normal schedule and the normal theming of the channel. But they're worth checking out and I wanted to let you know about them. So let's get started. Now, people who haven't been paying attention know Bobcat Goldthwaite as being that comedian who plays a dumb character and really isn't the kind of guy that you want to hang around with for any period of time. But two things I know. First off, he's a really good writer-director. He's been doing indie films for a couple of decades now, and he's been doing a really interesting one in. And the second thing I know is he was the, one of the funniest stand-ups I ever saw but leaving that aside, he did a movie in 2009, which is really interesting. And it's one of the best last things that Robin Williams did before he died. It's a movie called World's Greatest Dad. Robin Williams plays Lance Clayton, a writer and a single father and a high school English teacher. Ernest Hemingway once said all he wanted to do was write one true sentence. He also tried to scratch an itch in the back of his head with a shotgun. At a high school where his son Kyle attends. His son, played by Daryl Sabara, who people might remember was the boy kid in Spy Kids, Lance's son, Kyle, is a total shit. We don't know whether it's a developmental thing, whether he was just low intelligence, whether his access to the internet turned him into an incel troll. We don't know. And, before, and by the way, this, this predates incels and, and most kinds of trolling on the internet. And Lance is a kind of good-hearted guy. He's dating one of the other school teachers, played by Alexi Gilmore. But she's kind of a narcissist and is playing him off against another school teacher. And Lance is kind of living a life of quiet desperation. Then Lance finds his son in front of his computer one day, having done a David Carradine. He's killed himself due to autoerotic asphyxiation, which he read about on the internet. Now, Lance has shattered, and, and you know, he, he loves a kid, but he, he can't stand the kid. And so he fakes a suicide in the closet. Well, the, he, had his son, he basically hangs his son's body in the closet and writes a really poignant and heartfelt suicide note. Problem is, the suicide note goes viral. The whole high school gets involved. Lance becomes famous because of it. Lance uh, fakes some diary entries for his son and just kind of goes on this ride of making his son's memory better than his son was. And it's a really interesting film for that reason. It shows how things go viral online and, and in physical meat space. It shows how people can be convinced to be incredibly dishonest. There's a kind of political undertone to this as well. And in the middle of this is a man who is suffering grief and guilt at the same time and who really, really um, just can't deal with the cards he's been dealt. Meanwhile, his son's best friend, a kid called Andrew, is dealing with his own guilt and the fact that he doesn't think that Kyle was capable of writing that suicide note. And so it gets into an enormous tangle with Lance trying to deal with this celebrity he gets for basically changing the circumstances of his kid's death and how he extricates himself from that mess and how he kind of becomes a better person. It's a really interesting and deep film. It's an indie film. It only cost 10 million bucks. It didn't make its money back in any way because it was telling a story in a way that people didn't want to know. People love their internet pylons and their internet kind of viral sensations. And for Bobcat Goldthwaite, way back in 2009, to make a movie which says basically that these things aren't healthy for you and they can sometimes have a profound impact on the people at the focus of those viral um, rages that go on is, is a kind of interesting and a wise thing to do. I really should do a couple of reviews of some more Bobcat Goldflake films. There are a couple of them that are really, really deeply interesting indie films. But they're not the sort of films that make money. They're good films. They have something to say. They have a viewpoint. 
they're well made and well acted, but they're not going to be at the top of anybody's list, which is a real shame because I think that Bobcat Goldthwait is, is an interesting creative person and the movies he makes are sometimes way better than 99% of the stuff you get to see on your streaming algorithm. So I watched that and I enjoyed it. It's on a few streaming services. I think it's on Tubi at the moment here in Australia. I'm kind of glad it is. This is the kind of movie that I want more people to see. And unfortunately, uh, some people won't. I don't know who people hate more, cops or reporters. It's cops. That brings me to Confess Fletch, the 2022 movie directed by Greg Matola which is a reboot of the Fletch franchise that was started in the 1970s by Chevy Chase. And uh, they're based on a series of novels by Gregory McDonald. And Fletch in the novels is a much more amoral character than either Chevy Chase or the star of Confess Fletch, John Hamm, give us. But in an age of cynical as ours, it's a good time to reboot the Fletch franchise. And Confess Fletch is really good. It's got to do with stolen artworks. He Fletcher's is sent from Boston to Italy by his girlfriend Angela to recover her father's art collection, which was stolen and are in the possession of an American art dealer called Ronald Horan, played by Kyle McLaughlin, and Kyle McLaughlin's very good in this as well. He gets involved with not only Horan, but a bunch of investigating cops, played by Roy Wood Jr. and Aidan Mayeri. We also got Marsha Gay Harden in there playing the wife of the billionaire father. Uh, the billionaire father is played by Robert Picardo in a really nice little cameo at the end of the film. And it's got the usual things you expect from a Fletch movie. It's got the wry dialogue. It's got the uh, pretending to be something he's not. Uh, Fletch is an investigative journalist, of course, and he's trying to um, find out the mysteries. He's using his wits, basically, to stop from sinking. And he has an incredibly inflated sense of his own competence. But yet, somehow, some things work really well. And John Hamm is really good in the role. It's, it's a movie that works well. It's got that light touch that you need. There's, there's nothing dim and grim in this one. I want to see more movies with John Hamm playing Fletch. I think he is a much better fit than Chevy Chase was. We were kind of too aware of Chevy Chase being Chevy Chase in those movies. And that took away from them somewhat. And John Hamm's touch, which is lighter and kind of more self-aware than the Chevy Chase version. I got that police report you wanted. I just emailed it to you. It's encrypted. Uh, what's the password? Go F yourself. Really does work. It's got some beautiful locations. The movie is shot beautifully too, which is the other big advantage there. And it brings together a really nice ensemble of older actors and younger actors. So many movies these days just forget older character actors who have still got a long time to go before they're put out to pasture and who have incredible acting chops. Marsha Gay Harden playing the kind of horny mother to Fletcher's girlfriend is, is kind of fun in this one. And she has a, a wonderful time with it. John Slattery's in there as well, playing an old journalist friend of Fletcher's. And yeah, it's, it's one of those kind of light action comedies that we don't see enough of these days because comedy is hard to write and writing it in such a way that you're not going to transgress in exactly the wrong way is something that older comedy writers are struggling with but younger comedy writers haven't yet got the skills to put across very well. So I, I like this one. It works well. It's on streaming services. It's come out in the wake of knives out i think we're going to see more of these kind of crime comedies happening in at least for the next few years because glass onions comes out the second one of the benoit blanc films that um ryan johnson's made with daniel craig but uh confess fletch is a lot of fun and i, I enjoyed watching that one light touch well done and some interesting character roles and a few nice twists as well the plot moves along really interestingly so i've got four more for you as well let's do a bit of show and tell by the way, middle of the video, I'm going to let you know why you should become a patron for this channel on patreon.com slash paleo cinema. I think we've got Luna in the house. Middle-aged geek girl Sally bought me a present today. A children's book, sort of, called 
A Very Die Hard Christmas, which tells the story of Die Hard in the manner of a children's book. Now, I'm going to do a video on which I will release on the 24th of December Australian time. I'm going to read that to the audience. I'm going to read that to the Patreon people on Christmas Eve because Die Hard is the ultimate Christmas movie. So if you want to see me read A Very Die Hard Christmas, you're going to have to be a patron on patreon.com slash paleocinema at least for one month and enjoy that because I'm not putting it up on the main channel. Um, I won't get, I'll get a copyright strike if I do because this is copyright material. I'm going to do it and it's just a little thank you to the people who support the channel at Patreon and who have stuck with me even though I haven't given them much extra content over this year and I've really meant to, but things got ahead of me. So just be aware, if you want to see me do that, you're going to have to cop up a few bucks. But moving right along, um, I don't know whether I've talked about this one. I like it, so I'm going to talk about it again. Ricardo Fredo's I Vampiri. And is that upside down? Yes, it, no, it isn't. E. Vampiri was the first sound era Italian horror movie. Riccardo Freda made it in 1956. It was released in 1957. Titanus Films, which was the comp production company Freda worked for, Freda went to them and said, listen, I can make a horror movie cheaply. I can write a script in a couple of days. I can spend two weeks filming it. We can release it. Horror films are really big. This mob over in England called Hammer are doing it. Universal's doing it in America. Columbia's doing it in America. Why don't we get an Italian horror movie? Now, Italian horror movies weren't really a thing in the sound era. In the 1930s, Mussolini didn't like them, so they weren't released. End of World War II, people were more into Italian neorealism and comedies. So horror got left by the wayside. But this one, which is basically the story of an older woman who finds a potion of youth thanks to a very, very dodgy scientist is a lot of fun now the other interesting thing is two weeks shooting schedule last day or so Freda disappears his wife um jana maria canale is starring in the movie but Freda just ups and quits the cinematographer took over and rejigged the script shot a few extra scenes added a little bit of this and that used a little bit of stock footage to f kind of fill it out and the movie was released. And that cinematographer was Mario Bava, who saved this film from obscurity. And it's great. They, they used existing sets that were already around. They did a little tiny bit of location shooting. But this one's got a certain vibe about it. It's got a wonderful gothic vibe about it. There's a few familiar Italian acting faces. There's Paul Muller, who plays a character who's a drug addict who gets killed and then resurrected by the mad scientist. It doesn't make a lot of sense if you look at it logically, but it really is kind of creepy enough, and it has enough of that Mario Bava magic to make it really worthwhile. Uh, there's the back cover. You can kind of freeze that if you'd like to, to see the details. There are a few extras in it. This one's um, a few years old now, but... I really like it. It goes well with the later movie, Kaltiki, the Immortal Monster, which I think Freda did with Mario Bravo, or maybe Bava did it by himself. I don't remember the details. But Ivan Piri is one I recommend. It's got a mood more than it's got shocks and horrors, and it's got that kind of La Dolce Vita era Italian style that really works well as a horror movie. So while I was on a Bava kick, I decided to get this one out. It's from Arrow Video, so you know it's good. It's got a lot of extras. Blood and Black Lace, which is from 1965, directed by Barva, starring Cameron Mitchell and a whole bunch of Italian actors. It's probably the peak Giallo movie of all Gialli. It, it's got the incredible style to it. It's right from the start. The titles are vivid and interesting. They're super saturated colour. There's suspense. It's set in a fashion house and the models keep getting murdered and a diary that one of the dead models kept with everybody's secrets in it is stolen and hidden. And the murderer, who is masked, 
is going around killing all these models and, and incendiary people in various nasty and sadistic ways. It does that Jalo thing of combining kind of titillation with the horror. It's got some really well cast, interesting police officer characters. And because Cameron Mitchell is the big American star in the movie, you know he's involved in the murder somehow. And the music is really on point as well. Now I'm going to show you the back of that one too. Freeze frame that one because there are a ton of really good extras there. It's a fantastically put together package, this one. And I watched this two days ago. And it's wonderfully shallow. It's all the stuff that Dario Argento and all those other guys later on copied. I, lo I like it a lot. I'm going to have to dip more into Bava's Giallo movies. I've got a few of them, but I haven't had time to watch them yet, but I really want to hit more of them. And uh, he, this movie would have had to have been a big influence on people like Umberto Lenzi and all those other guys who did Giallo as well. But Blood and Black Lace, uh, you can pick that up, I think, from Zavi. Pick it up from Arrow Video directly if you want to, but it should be in your collection if you're into Italian movies at all. Next movie I've got for you is a 2022 action comedy as well. It's uh, one that I like so much that as soon as I saw the digital copy, I went out and ordered the 4K because I'm going to want to have it in my collection. It's smart and it's knowing. It's based on a 2010 novel called Maria Beetle. Uh, written by Kotaro Isaka. And it's a film called Bullet Train, starring Brad Pitt, Joey King, Brian Tyree Henry, Aaron Taylor Johnson, and uh, Hiroyuki Sonata, uh, along with a bunch of cameos I'm not going to spoil for you. Now, you might have seen the trailer for this one, and, and the movie is a lot of fun, and the trailer's a lot of fun too. Brad Pitt plays a guy whose code name is Ladybug, and who is an assassin now. He, he's suffering from anxiety disorders, He's trying to get his life together. He's kind of washed up, really, and doesn't have his ducks lined up at all. He wants to make some um, life changes, and he gets this job to basically steal a suitcase on a Shinkansen journey between Tokyo and Kyoto. Now, there's a few limitations here. He doesn't know who has the case. He knows what the case looks like, and he doesn't know who the enemies are. Now, there are other, other limitations. The Shinkansen is making several stops, but they're only stopping for one minute. And if you know Japanese trains at all, you know that they are precise on time. And so every time the train stops and something has to occur outside the train, whoever's out the side of the train has 60 seconds to get their ass back on the train, otherwise they're left on the platform. So apart from Ladybug, we've got a pair of English brothers who are assassins, and their codenames are Lemon and Tangerine, played by Brian Tyree Henry and Aaron Taylor Johnson, who people might remember was the kid in Kick-Ass and Kick-Ass 2. He's grown up, he's 32 years old now. And he does a really nice role playing Tangerine, his brother Lemon, played by Brian Tyree Henry, who isn't English, but he plays an English character. He's uh, a really interesting character because he's got an obsession with Thomas the Tank Engine. And he's a very, very good judge of character. And he has a sticker book of Thomas the Tank Engine character. And he attributes the attributes of those characters to the people he meets on the train. It sounds silly, but it works. Meanwhile, there's a Russian kingpin who's taken over the Japanese mafia. A guy called the White Death. I'm not going to tell you who plays him because it's, it's a bit of a spoiler. Who wants to get the briefcase, which has $10 million in it as well as his kidnapped son, who is played by Logan Lerman, who was in the Percy Jackson films. Uh, this movie is over-the-top silliness. It's not realistic. In fact, it's hyper-realistic. The action is really good. Brad Pitt did 95% of the stunts himself, which is pretty impressive for a guy in his 50s. And he's getting this kind of mid-career change where he is playing self-depreciating, slightly humorous characters. The only thing I can really compare it to is Cary Grant. Cary Grant, later in his career, played kind of very self-depreciating characters. Uh, I'm thinking about North by Northwest and Charade and things like that. And Brad Pitt's kind of doing that. He's got the style to pull it off. He's not getting plastic surgery, so he ends up looking like a well-worn statue. <laughs> um... 
And and he is a lot of fun in this one. And the cameos are great as well. There's one cameo with a, a fairly famous actor on the train. There's a couple of other cameos that aren't on the train. And one person you only see but never hear from. Uh, this, is, this is one of those kind of self-knowing and very meta movies. If you've ever been on a Japanese Shinkansen train, you know what it's like. This one's actually anime-themed, which makes it even more fun. And one of the assassins on the train um, is part of that anime theming in the, in the train. There's this craziness that goes on here. There's a flashback scene to a whole bunch of murders. And the music playing over it is Inglebird Humperdinck singing I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. And right at the end, there's all the action that happens on the train is re-shown to us from the viewpoint of a water bottle, a bottle of Fiji water. Now, the, the water bottle is important, important to the plot. I'm not trying to just say it isn't. But, yeah, this, this is great. It's got kind of, you know, it's got katana fights. It's got people punching and hitting each other. It's got people using briefcases of weapon and there's pl- explosives planted in various places. Oh, yeah, and there's also a deadly snake at loose in the train. They just keep piling jeopardy upon jeopardy in this one. And it worked for me. I don't think it's the best movie ever, but it is a lot of fun. It really does balance a lot of plates on sticks and spins them around and it keeps all the plates going to right at the end. Now, production of this one was kind of interesting because it was the second unit was filmed in Japan to get the location shots, but it was filmed in Los Angeles because Japan was locked down and you couldn't get film crews to japan until very very recently but it works it's a lot of fun if you just want to have a good fun ride you're going to see bullet train and go along with it because um it's probably one of the best action comedies i've seen in a couple of years now the last one i found out about because somebody i know on facebook watched it on netflix and they said they didn't like it and from the things they said about it i suspected that they didn't understand the film. And and lo and behold, I was right. It's a Malaysian horror film from 2019 called Revenge of the Ponti Anak. Now, a Ponti Anak is a special kind of vampire in Malaysia and in Indonesia, in the Kalimantan area of Indonesia on Borneo, which is kind of different than a European vampire. I mean, European vampires, you've got, you've got a bit of range with European vampires. Now, vampires vary between cultures. I mean, look, you've got the Wordalax in Slavic countries, which you saw in Maria Bava's Black Sunday. You've got the Alokar in the Jewish tradition. That's another kind of vampire. In Madagascar, they got a thing called the Romanga, which are itinerant outlaws that suck blood and eat the toenail clippings of the rich. I'm not kidding on that. In Trinidad, they've got some vampires they call Suyukans, which sounds rude but isn't. And in Australia, we have landlords. So vampires differ, differ between different countries. They are different habits based on the cultural sensitivities. And the Pontianaks are very specific to that part of Malaysia, Singapore, and Kalimantan in Indonesia. These vampires are the spirits and and the bodies and the resurrected bodies of women who died in childbirth or died in childbirth and their children died with them. Not always the case, but most of the time it is. They are very, very dangerous. They're attracted to communities because if people leave clean washing out on the line overnight they will detect that and find their way to a village using that smell which is why in a lot of areas of malaysia people bring their washing in at night they have a smell of flowers about them but when you get closer they start smelling like rotten flesh and they often appear as very beautiful women with long fingernails now the revenge of the pontianak is a really interesting 2019 malaysian film which netflix picked up it's about a guy called khalid who's getting married to a beautiful woman called Sita. He has a son from his previous marriage. His ex-wife left him and left the baby on the doorstep, and he's raised his son by himself. Sita likes the son Nick, and things seem to be going on well with the wedding ceremony. His friend Reyes is, is living in the city and is doing quite well. This is all set in 1965, and he comes to the wedding and kind of starts flirting with the wedding singer, who's a beautiful woman, and... Then he starts singing a love song aimed at Sita and Khalid. And something starts coming out of the jungle at them. 
uh, through the banana plantations on the edge of the village where Khalid and Sita live. Pontianaks are attracted to banana plantations as well. Nothing happens on the night of the wedding except when Rais is driving home and he takes the uh, beautiful singer with him. They, they're stopped by a woman standing in the middle of the road and the next morning Reyes is found in the village. About 15 metres up the trunk of a tree, hanging from the tree, with all of his guts torn out and blood all over the place. The local holy man of the village tells them that they've got a Pontianak and that they need to clean their house and some of the villagers blame Sita because she's an outsider and things just escalate until we find out what the true story is and the true story is a lot more complex and a lot more tragic than the initial setup of the film allows now this is a beautifully filmed movie the cinematography is great it's not necessarily a high budget film the saturated colors are really good the slow escalation of the horror is a lot of fun and it gives us a monster which is is very different than you get in so many other vampire films. Khalid is not the protagonist of the film, which is, surprised me. Uh, the twists in this one are really interesting. The protagonists of the film are Sita, uh, sorry, Siti, her name's not Sita, it's Siti, played by Shinti Feliziana, and Mina, the, the Pontaniac, played by Noor Fazora. Now, uh, Khalid's played by Remy Ishak, and he's very good in the role. So the viewpoint shifts from the masculine viewpoint to the feminine viewpoint as we find out what really happened nine years before when the baby was left on the doorstep of Khalid's um, hut, basically. Really interesting film. It doesn't play like a, a Western horror film in the sense that there aren't jump scares and kind of strident music selling the horror. It's uh, one of those movies you've got to watch closely. And even if it starts out a little bit slowly and you're trying to figure out what's going on, ultimately it's really, really rewarding. And here comes Loon of the Beast. And this is one of the problems that we have by being a bit too kind of tunnel visioned in our movie viewing because there have been about 17 or 18 movies about the Pontianak made since 1957. Some of them are Singaporean, some are Malaysian, some are Indonesian films. But they all have the same kind of monster in them. And a number of them tell the same, same sort of story about um, a village being attacked by this very peculiar kind of vampire. Now, you can look at it a number of different ways with the Pontianak. It's a warning to men not to treat women badly. It's also a kind of horror tale that comes from a culture where women died in childbirth, not infrequently. And it's a way of acknowledging that in the mythology of a culture. And uh, yeah, it, it makes it a really interesting film. By the way, the way you kill and stop a Pontianak is you have to jam a metal spike into its neck. If you jam a metal spike into its neck, according to traditional mythology on this, which is not the mythology of the movie, the Pontianak will become a good woman and a good wife to you as long as that spike is stuck in her neck. If you stab the spike into the top of her head, you'll kill her. Now, if you remove the spike, she reverts back to being a bloodthirsty monster who will chew your guts out. Did my homework on this one. But Revenge of the Pontianak is, is a movie on Netflix that you should check out if you're curious at all about other cultures' horror movies. One of the things I've said over the last couple of years is that I want to see more movies that tell the stories of other cultures. I'm, I'm kind of sick of kind of pale white men movies <laughs> to a certain extent. Though I do enjoy many, many, many of them. I'm getting increasingly curious about movies that are told from very different cultural viewpoints than my own. And Revenge of the Pontianak was one of those movies that surprised me and uh, I was on a kind of steep learning curve for the first half of it. But after that, it uh, rewarded my close attention. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, leave a comment. Tell me if you liked the, the video, whether you're going to watch any of these movies, whether you have seen any of these movies. But I think 
on my Netflix, I'm going to dive a lot more into the non-English language, non-European genre films that Netflix hides deep, deep, deep into the algorithm. You can also support the channel by going to patreon.com slash paleo cinema. And just another reminder, Christmas Eve, we get me reading that for the Patreon supporters as well, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm going to have to read it a few times so I get the scansion right. It's it's written like a children's book, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like the Nightmare Before Christmas with, with Hans Gruber. So anyway, until next time, look after yourselves. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Really dive into some horror movies from cultures with which you're not very familiar. You're going to have a lot of fun if you just stick with it. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs>